Miguel de la Torre. Uh, the title is When the Oppressed Become the Oppressors, a dialogue between a Latin ethic, Ara Jodor, and the Palestinian apartheid uh, dilemma. Uh, Dr. Miguel de la Torre is an international scholar, documentarian, novelist, and academic author, and scholarly activist as well. Uh, he has authored over 100 articles and published 44 books, five of which won national awards, I assume, in the United States. He is the professor of social ethics and Latina studies uh, at the Elif School of Theology in Denver. Uh, a Fulbright, as a Fulbright scholar, he has taught in Indonesia, Mexico, South Africa, Germany, uh, now lecturing in Palestine. Uh, within his guild, uh, the American Ameri Academy of Religion, he is the recipient of 22, 2020, the year 2020, Excellence in Teaching Award. And in 2021, he won the Martin Marty Public Understanding of Religion Award. A scholar activist, Dr. De La Torre, wrote the screenplay to a documentary on immigration and wrote uh, an auto-fictional magical realism novel. We're honored to have you with us. Gracias. Buenas tardes. Before I begin, I want to take a moment to just position myself. I am a social ethicist, and I'm interested in how to develop praxis of resistance in dealing with power that legitimizes and normalizes oppression. I'm also a refugee. It would be hubris of me to talk about these praxis in a universal type setting. The Europeans do that. Instead, I realize that my opinions are very uh, subjective and I want to share them and see if we have anything of commonality, if anything resonates. If it doesn't, that's cool. You at least hear how I'm trying to deal with structural oppression within my own context. I begin by rejecting hope. Um, I took a group of students to Cuernavaca in Mexico in where we went to a squatter village by the railroad tracks. And afterwards, you know, we began to unpack what we saw. And, and one of my students said, you know, how these people live is so terrible. But when I saw the hope in the eyes of the little girl, I felt rejuvenated. And at that point, I had an epistemological meltdown. <laughs> What I said was, I'm not quite sure what you saw in her eyes, but within a few years, she'll probably be turning tricks to put food on the table. Worse, she might be stuck in an abusive marriage. You see, there is no hope for this little girl. There's no hope for her children or her children's children. Neoliberalism has constructed a structure that has choked the hope out of the world marginalized. So I begin by dissing hope which I know it's not easy to do because after all, the gift of the spirits is joy, love, peace, and hope. Um, all things do not work for good, even for those who love God and are called according to God's purposes. And part of my reason is because I read hope in Spanish. And in Spanish, hope is esperanza. From where we get the, the root of that word is esperar, to wait. So when I'm saying hope in Spanish, I'm really am saying wait. And we're not quite sure what we're waiting for. You see, hope works if we could reduce it to the personal. I, I'm a refugee. I grew up in the slums of New York City, a tenement building, one bathroom per tenement floor, rats and roaches. Um, and I made it out of the barrio. I made it. I became, a, I got educated, I became a professor. I make not great money, but you know, I, I, I have a certain degree of a status in my community. So I made it. You could lift me up and say, look, there was hope. A barrio kid could make it. But the reality is that hundreds of my compatriots are six feet under because they never made it out of the barrio. But as long as you focus the hope on the one, we could ignore everyone else who is drowning and suffering. So for me, if we're going to truly have a conversation about decolonizing um, our, you know, our minds, we may have to go beyond just decolonizing Christianity to maybe even rejecting Christianity 
and all the Eurocentric philosophies and theologies that have wrapped itself around this understanding of Christianity. How do I re-engage with the tradition and the faiths of my own ancestors, which I'm going to talk about later? Um, hope only works as long as we embrace salvation history. And we all know salvation history, to, you know, talking, thank you Hegel, time is moving in an upward trajectory towards a utopia. Um, it's not just only religion, but Marxism is a salvation history. Things are getting better and better until the state wither the way. Capitalism is a salvation history. You know, the rising tide will raise all boats. Um, and, and, and so, and if we have and, and embrace the salvation history, then yes, we could hope because there is the promise of the future. But what if Walter Benjamin was correct? And there is no linear, no, no linear line to history. If history is nothing but chaos, one chaos after another after another with no rhyme or reason. What if instead, if there is no history, hope is, I mean, I'm sorry, history becomes nothing but moments in time that are strung together to justify the oppression that exists today. What if what Martin Luther King said, that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends to, towards justice, what if the universe doesn't care which way that arc bends? And what if it's, if it's going to bend towards justice, we are the ones that have to do the bending? Because if not, Maybe the, maybe the writer of Ecclesiastes was right. Vanity of vanity, says the teacher, absolute fertility, everything is meaningless. Now that everybody's in a good mood, let me explain why <laughs> I want to embrace hopelessness. My people live in the Saturday. In other words, all we know is the crucifixion and the blood and the gore of Friday and I'm not quite sure if a Sunday is going to come around. I'm told that the Sunday is going to come, but I haven't seen it yet. And if I'm going to be in solidarity with the oppressed, I must sit with my people in the Saturday of their experience. And for me to come along and say all things work for good, those according to God's purposes, sounds somewhat trite, somewhat disingenuous, Somewhat, you can even say, oppressive. Oppressive because hope domesticates. When I went to Auschwitz, there was a sign that said, work will set you free. That was hope. That if I keep my head down, if I don't make trouble, if I follow the rules, and I work hard, I will be free. The fact is, you won't. They all died anyway. But see, if I have hope, I will domesticate myself not to change anything because I might lose the little I have. My job in preaching hopelessness is to let people realize they have nothing to lose. Because once I realize I have nothing to lose, that's when I become the most radical and the most dangerous to the powers that be. Hopelessness rejects easy fixes. So, what becomes the ethical response? And here's where my, I have to quote my intellectual mentor, Jose Martí. El vino de plátano y si sale agrio sigue siendo nuestro vino. And for those of you who have yet learned the language of the angels, let me translate that for you. We will make our wine, I mean, sorry, we will make our wine out of plantains, and even if it comes out sour, it's still our wine. So this religiosity that I'm trying to embrace is made from my own cultural roots. And part of that cultural root is to realize what it becomes my ethical response to the oppressive structures that exist. In the United States, we're the only country where you have to go to the police department to get a permit from the police department to protest the police department for police brutality. We have domesticated protests. In the United States, we're the only country 
where you can drive to a march. You can drive to a march. So, the ethics that I am advocating for refuses to follow the rules of those who have created the rules to maintain the structures that keeps me oppressed. I call this an ethics para joder. Now again, for those who do not know Spanish, I'm not going to translate joder. Um, it's a certain four-letter word in English that begins with F and ends with K. It's an ethics that screws with the structures that exist. It's an ethics like Jesus overturning the tables in the, in the temple that messes things up. It's the only way to move beyond the structures that have domesticated how we can protest, and how we can speak back to the powers to be. Let me give you a quick example of what, of how, you know, how I came up with this. Look, I didn't come up with it. I am seeing what the oppressed of the world are doing, and I'm just giving it a word. Um, growing up in New York City, there was a group called the Young Lords. This was a street gang in the old neighborhood. And what the Young Lords did was they got the, the consciousness raised. So they went ahead and they cleaned up um, Spanish Harlem. And they clean up all the garbage, they put them in bags, they put them on the corner, they call up the sanitation department to pick up the garbage. But the sanitation department only showed up whenever they felt like in communities of color back in the 60s. So they took those bags to Third Avenue, the major artery of New York City, build a wall and set it on fire during rush hour traffic. Cops came, beat them up, threw them in jail, but the New York Times also showed up and wrote articles about the sanitation problems and racism. Now, in Spanish Harlem, they pick up the garbage twice a day. I mean, twice a week. In other words, by jodiendo, by screwing with the power structures, they were able to find opportunities that brought change to those structures. But the government's not the only one that we have to jodet against. So was the church. The young lords went to the Primera Iglesia Metrorista, the first Methodist church of Spanish Harlem, and they talked to the pastor about you know, we want to have a food kitchen, we want to have a clothes kitchen, I mean a clothes closet. We want to educate our children about um, our, our culture. We want to go ahead and uh, provide legal services. And the pastor says, ah, oh, a bunch of commies, get out of here. So they showed up that Sunday, they picked up the pastor, they threw him out of the church, and they nailed on the door the people's church. And they did all those things for about three weeks until the cops came and beat them up. So looking at what the oppressed are doing, I am trying to develop an ethical paradigm that follows them. And part of this paradigm um, includes the image of the trickster. And this is important. Every community, um, oppressed community in the United States have trickster images. The, the indigenous people have coyote, and they have, um, um, uh, the, the, the African Americans have bear rabbit, um, Mexicanos have cantinfra, Puerto Ricans have Juan Bobo. I'm from Cuba. Um, green, I grew up in the religion of Santeria, which is the Yoruba religion that was brought to Cuba by the, uh, by the enslaved. And I am a child of Elegua, and Elegua is the Yoruban trickster. So this I, image of trickster I have always grown up with, and I'm trying to figure out that the way we do ethics is to play the trickster when you have oppressive structures, because that's the only way that you can maybe move the conversation in a new direction of opposite the dominant culture that has created these structures to keep one oppressed. So, if neoliberalism has won, if colonialism has won, if none of that's going to change in our lifetime, I mean, we'll be food for the worms, and these structures will continue to operate. If everything is lost, why continue to struggle? And to ask that question shows a middle class privilege where you can walk away. Because the oppressed have no choice but to continue the struggle. Um, I fight for justice not because I think I'm going to win. And this is what I'm trying to tell my students. Do you fight for justice because you're going to win? Because chances are you're not going to win. And the problem is if you think you're going to win, you'll get burned out before the fight has even begun. So I don't fight for justice because I think I'm going to win. I don't fight for justice because I think I'm going to get an extra ruby in my crown when I get to heaven. 
I fight for justice because it defines not only the faith I claim, but more importantly, it defines my very humanity. So, I have about one minute left. I guess what I want to get across is that when the Empire does strike back, the Jedi may not return. <laughs> the Jedi may not return. It has not for my people. Empire has been striking back, and the poor are getting poor, the rich are getting richer, and oppression is manifesting itself in, in new ways. So, in the preaching of hopelessness, I respond with an ethics para Oren, an ethics in where I engage non-violently in line so I could discover what is truth. I cheat so I could level the playing field. I steal so I can feed the hungry. I joke so I can speak truth to the powerless in the presence of the powerful. And I disrupt and I deceive in the hope of liberation. Gracias.